Hi, I'm Jay Allen Sanford from the San Diego Reader. Thanks for joining me as we talk about another episode of the 1950s science fiction television anthology, Tales of Tomorrow. I've written for magazines like Cult Movies, Starlog, Film Facts, and Midnight Marquee, and the Reader published my in-depth history of this program a while back. Tonight we're watching what might not be the best episode of the Tales of Tomorrow, but it is probably the best known and probably the most seen episode by virtue of its screening on television a lot, uh, like on the Sci-Fi Channel's retro TV lineup, and a lot of us saw it on USA Network's weekend program Night Flight. Also turns up a lot on those budget DVD sets because uh, these episodes are public domain property. There's really just so much marquee value to names like Lon Chaney and Frankenstein, so... Even if far fewer people have heard of Tales of Tomorrow, I've had the luxury of being able to listen to and enjoy the uh, other two commentaries that were already recorded for this episode. So I'll endeavor to not repeat any of that material here. The 16th episode of Tales of Tomorrow was broadcast live as it was performed on the ABC Network soundstage at East 66th Street in New York City on January 18, 1952, aired at 9.30 p.m. Eastern. You may have noted that the credits listed our star as Lon Chaney minus the junior. That wasn't uncommon at that point in his career, but uh, we'll get around to Mr. Chaney when he makes his dramatic entrance shortly. We're looking here at the characters of Victor Frankenstein, his fiancée Elizabeth, uh, her father, Frankenstein's former teacher, and uh, for some reason or other, Victor's uh, nephew's there. We'll find a little bit more about him in a bit. And uh, They're talking about um, building the perfect human and Dr. Frankenstein's fiance says that the, quote, the perfect human should be giant in size, strong as a gorilla, disease-proof, durable, and quick to learn, unquote. Which is exactly what Dr. Frankenstein is experimenting with, uh, but he doesn't exactly invite them down to the lab to see what's on the slab. He's actually still keeping it a secret here. That doesn't admit to what he's doing, but uh, you would think that people, his, his family and his friends here, would be wondering why he lives on a remote island in Switzerland in a decrepit 16th century castle with nobody around other than a, a butler and a maid. Uh, and this young nephew, whose only purpose really seems to be is to serve as monster baits. <laughs> well, also, you know, this was the early 1950s, uh, and because it is television, I, I assume, there's never any reference in this show that the doctor's experiments have anything to do with reanimating dead body parts. That's not mentioned at all. All it says about the uh, monster's origin is that it was... Frankenstein's creation. So, uh, we're going to talk about the star here, John Newland, who plays uh, Victor Frankenstein. He, you might recognize him, of course, from the uh, One Step Beyond series, which he, he was one of the co-creators of. Uh, he was in another Tales of Tomorrow besides this. He was in one of the uh, adaptations they did of a classic piece of literature. He, did, uh, he started in The Portrait of Dorian Gray, adapting an Oscar Wilde story. And uh, his series, One Step Beyond, is still very well regarded. It was originally well known as Alcoa Presents and used to dramatize supposedly real instances of paranormal and supernatural occurrences. And uh, by real, it was just meaning somebody said it happened. It wasn't really a well-researched show, but certainly a fascinating look into uh, the, the parapsychology field in its infancy. And it was a big deal in the late 50s and early 60s. One Step Beyond was shot right on the MGM lot and he had full access to the studio's wardrobe department. Uh, the budget per episode ran about $30,000 to $50,000. And Newland himself here directed and narrated on screen all 96 episodes of One Step Beyond. Ran from 1959 to 1961. And uh, it was known for featuring a lot of then little known talents like young Warren Beatty. Uh, in the same episode as a young John, J John Fontaine, in fact. Uh, and also had the show's uh, stars included William Shatner, Christopher Lee, Cloris Leachman, Jack Lord, Donald Pleasance, Suzanne Plachette turns up in one. Uh, there was a sequel series launched about 20 years later in 1978 with the same production team, basically. It was called The Next Step Beyond. But that, that didn't last too long. Uh, John Newland also directed a lot of classic TV movies like uh, Crawl Space in 1972 which is a real creepy story co-directed by Buzz Kulick from The Twilight Zone about a childless middle-aged couple who finds a wild child uh, manservant, basically, he's uh, living in their, their, their home's crawl space. Uh, John Newland also directed a, a well-regarded 1973 TV movie called Don't Be Afraid of the Dark with Kim Darby. And he directed the original Star Trek episode, Errand of Mercy, 
That's the one where Kirk and Spock are on a planet full of pacifists and don't even put up a fight when the Klingons show up to take over the whole planet. Also as a director, he moved to L.A. and began directing TV programs like The Loretta Young Show, Bachelor Father, Man from Uncle, uh, Dr. Kildare, Hawaii Five-O, Matt Helm, Daniel Boone, Police Woman, did a Sixth Sense, uh, directed a bunch of a, a show called The Man Who Never Was, ran from 66 to 67, had Robert Lansing as an international spy. In fact, some of those episodes are written by uh, the fellow he co-created One Step Beyond with, Mervyn Girard. Uh, Newland was also involved with shows like Alfred Hitchcock Presents. Uh, he's well known from the Boris Karloff's thriller series. He did the Pigeons from Hell episode, as well as uh, directing The Return of Andrew Bentley, Portrait Without a Face, and Man of Mystery. Uh, did one of the Rod Serling Night Galleries in 72, episode called There Aren't Any More McBains. And he did several episodes of, the, uh, of Insight, which is sometimes called the Christian Twilight Zone, Sunday morning anthology series. And uh, didn't direct a whole lot of feature films, but he did do one in 1957 called That Night that was nominated for two British Academy Film Awards. And he directed a slightly supernatural feature film in 1974 called The Legend of Hillbilly John. <clears throat> he also was a radio star on the radio. He was the announcer's voice on CBS Mystery Theater right up through the mid-70s. Uh, one, one of his final jobs was a two-part Wonder Woman episode in 1979, Phantom of the Roller Coaster. Well, one of John Newland's most unique show business credits is that he was the first guy to ever do psychedelic mushrooms on television. It was part of a One Step Beyond episode called The Sacred Mushroom. And he was filmed in a California laboratory talking with researchers about mushrooms uh, for a story that featured no actors, no script. And uh, he actually also included footage of him flying into rural Mexico to harvest the mushrooms and did it on camera. He was, uh, look at that, he was our uh, TV's first psychedelic tripster. So Lon Chaney's making his uh, debut here. Some of the equipment you could see in some other episodes, like uh, Verdict from Space. Uh, as soon as he bursts into the frame, Lon Chaney Jr.'s take on the monster here is very different from his 1942 performance in The Ghost of Frankenstein. Of course, Universal held the rights to the flat-headed, neck-bolted version of the creature. So the Tales of Tomorrow uh, interpretation here kind of hews closer to the uh, emotionally outraged and, and unstoppably elemental incarnation from the original novel. Although it can be said that's about the only thing they got from the original novel in this, for this adaptation. Uh, but I feel it's a very energetic and, and a barely restrained performance by Cheney Jr. that could favorably compare to uh, Robert De Niro's 1994 portrayal of the monster and Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. In fact, you'll note that the scarred and bald makeup here is kind of similar to what, what they did on De Niro in that film. And it resembles what Hammer would end up doing uh, with their Frankenstein monster shortly after this. Uh, makeup artist named Vin Kehoe designed Cheney's makeup here, and uh, it had to be different enough from Jack Pierce's classic universal design uh, for the ghost of Frankenstein when he played the creature there that uh, they, they, they wanted to avoid getting sued by Universal. So, I mentioned it's not really hewing very closely to the original Mary Shelley story, but uh, it was adapted by a writer named Henry Myers, who really did his best to update it with the low budget and uh, you know, set restrictions that he was working with. And, uh, and I maintain that Cheney's performance here, by the way, is a lot better than he's usually given credit for. We'll get back to that. H Henry Meyer scripted around a dozen films in the 1930s, including The Black Room in 1935. He did some films like Million Dollar Legs, Father Brown Detective, The Luckiest Girl in the World. Uh, and he wrote that classic Western, Destry Rides Again. Some of his scripts were adaptations of stories by others, as in this case. He did one called Murder by the Clock in 1931. And he wrote the 1949 version of Alice in Wonderland, you may have seen, the version that stars Carol March and, and a bunch of absolutely nightmarish puppets. <laughs> uh, he also wrote a handful of TV shows the year previous to this in 1951. Uh, he, did, uh, he wrote an episode of an anthology that we mention a lot in these commentaries, a show called Suspense. He wrote an episode uh, of that called Blood on the Trumpet that starred John Forsyth and young Cloris Leachman. He also wrote for shows like Danger, uh, Big Town uh, pretty much seems to have retired, at least under the name Henry Myers, not long after this Frankenstein adaptation aired. Um, so, Dr. Frankenstein here, he says his monster has the strength of ten men, but, <laughs> well, uh, you notice he had only strapped him down with little more than a couple of suitcase straps, so that's why the monster's already up again. It's portrayed by John Newland here. you got to say Dr. Victor Frankenstein is not only kind of a dummy, but he's, he's a pretty terrible person. 
Doesn't seem to care at all about his own servant girl being uh, murdered in a bit. He, uh, near the end, he blatantly uses his girlfriend and his little boy as, as, a, as bait to lure the, the creature into a trap. But, but look at this scene here. Look, look at this hallway that they built for this. I mean, I would point out that is excellent uh, set direction, or rather art direction. And uh, it even only takes him around 10 seconds to get loose there. I do want to point out that cinematography because it's a very dramatic and somewhat unnerving close-up of the monster's back. And the way it's shot as he stumbles into that fancifully designed hallway is, is really well done for early live TV. So I'll tell you a little bit about our maid here. It's an actress named Peggy Allenby. And uh, she'd been on one other Tales of Tomorrow the previous year to this, in 1951. Uh, she did a very good episode called A Child is Crying. The story had been adapted for several other TV shows. Uh, in the 50s, she was doing all the anthology TV shows like Philco Television Playhouse. Uh, she did Cosmopolitan Theater, both of those in 1951. Uh, she did the big ones like Studio One, Armstrong Circle Theater, Lux Video Theater, and the United States Steel Hour. She was a regular cast member of the 1950s uh, TV show First Love. She played Doris Kennedy on hundreds of episodes of that. And in the late 50s and early 60s, she was a regular on, a, on the TV soap opera The Edge of Night. The butler that uh, we're looking at, that's an actor named Farrell Pelly. He was an Irishman who you may remember as Paddy O'Scanlan in the 1959 Disney film Darby O'Gill and the Little People. He was a very accomplished stage actor who had appeared in a 1961 episode of Tales of Tomorrow called The Invader. Uh, he did the usual TV anthologies like most of the folks we talk about here. Studio One, United States Steel Hour. Uh, he did Omnidus. He did Robert Montgomery Presents. He's also in the Martin Kane Private Eye series as well as I Spy uh, and Naked City, which was an early 1960s, uh, basically an NYPD cop show. In 1960, Farrell Pelly starred with Jason Robards in a live TV production of The Iceman Cometh, where he played Harry Hope, and he did a 1962 adaptation of Arsenic and Old Lace. So, all of the actors give decent performances here, but Lon Chaney gets a, a bad rap, and you hear a lot about that in the other, uh, the other commentaries for this episode, but... Uh, here we see one of several instances where Cheney is supposedly accused of messing up the broadcast. Um, and, and the allegations go that uh, apparently he, he may have been drinking uh, not, not only on the set, but before they actually went to film it. The cast used to go to uh, a place over across Central Park, uh, Café des Artistes on West 67th. And, uh, and they say that he might have been drinking over there. But... Um, Oh, if he was drinking, I feel his performance here rises above any, any, any impairment that he might have uh, been, been suffering from. Um, one of the Tales of Tomorrow makeup people does tell a story, I think in one of the uh, issues of Famous Monsters of Film Land, uh, claims that during this episode that Cheney Jr. Had a, uh, took the jar that the makeup uh, woman had that normally would hold disinfectant liquid. And you would dip the combs in to disinfect them. And she made a claim that he had replaced the disinfectant in those jars with liquor that he would keep trying to uh, sneak sips from. <laughs> because, uh, I guess he sat in the makeup chair a, a long time. And I, I feel actually that that is more likely the cause of any of the bloopers that we see here. L look at this performance here. This is the first time he sees himself in the mirror. And uh, having just now looked at this beautiful child that he holds up in, kind of contrast their view here it, it, it's a very overtly physical performance but i maintain that if he's drunk he's really putting out a journeyman performance still despite that so uh, allegedly he thought that this was a rehearsal and that would explain why he does things like uh, uh you, you'll see in a minute he walks over to a prop chair and uh, picks it up like uh, like he's supposed to break it and throw it down but uh, he didn't do that because as he said later, he, he thought during the first act that it was a rehearsal. He'd spent three hours sitting in that makeup chair and lost track of time. Uh, and by the time he made it back out onto the, uh, the sound stage, uh, he didn't realize that this was actually the live broadcast going out over the air. Uh, he assumed it was still a rehearsal. That, that's why there's a few times where you see him. Uh, there's one where he picks up a chair and he just kind of mouths to himself, save it, it looks like he's saying, and he puts the chair back down. And, uh, and that's probably what's happening there. I, I tend to side with... Uh, Mr. Cheney's version of events, I think that probably he did lose track of time and he did think that it was a rehearsal because you'll note that in the second act after the commercial, which is cut from this version that we're seeing here, 
Uh, you'll note that he comes back from the show uh, and, and then gives a, an unrestrained performance. He takes the props that he's supposed to break and he breaks them on cue. And, and it's fairly evident that at that point somebody told him uh, this is actually going out over the air now. This is, this is a live broadcast. And that's why the second half has him sort of more on the ball there. Uh, if he was really heavily impaired by alcohol, I feel, I don't think he would have been able to pull it together as well as he does, nor do I think that he would have done uh, you know, such a superb performance here. Because um, he sat in the chair for over three hours while the other actors had a chance to block and rehearse. He didn't get a chance to rehearse that part there. So there, there is a story that I will relate that Robert F. Lewin told me. He was the agency executive who was on the set for every episode of Tales of Tomorrow, uh, from the very first to the last. And I interviewed him in the late 1980s, and I'll read you his quote here uh, about those allegations. And according to him, he says, quote, He was not sober. He was drunk is what it was. It's true he thought it was a rehearsal, but it was not. He had done a dress rehearsal and gone into his dressing room and drank and drank, and when he came back, he didn't know what was going on. He goofed about three or four lines of dialogue. Our director, Don Medford, was so upset that he wanted to hit Lon, except Lon was too big for him. <laughs> so, uh, well, we don't really know. We'll never know. But uh, again, I maintain that the performance here is a lot better uh, than he's given credit for in, a, in, in a very bad raps. Uh, I'll tell you about that director that was just mentioned, uh, Don Medford. Uh, he directed around 35 episodes of Tales of Tomorrow. And considering the show ran for 85 episodes, that, that's, a, that's a large bulk. He, he did hundreds of TV shows, including five episodes of The Twilight Zone, as well as Af Alfred Hitchcock Presents, The Fugitive, M Squad, The Invaders. Uh, he did nearly three dozen episodes of the FBI, uh, did a couple dozen Berettas, Dynasty, Mrs. Columbo, Airwolf. He also occasionally scripted and produced the shows he worked on. Uh, the Twilight Zones he did are probably closest to the work that you see on Tales of Tomorrow that he did. Uh, he, helmed, he helmed the Genie episode, The Man in the Bottle. He did The Mirror with Peter Falk. And, and, and by the way, note the monster just got shot in the, in, in the crotch here. That was very rude of the good Dr. Frankenstein. <laughs> he falls uh, supposedly several stories here, but of course, uh, you, you don't really think that he's going to let getting shot in the ball stop him from getting back at this fop Dr. Frankenstein, do you? So, well, Don uh, Medford was actually mentioned by Jack Klugman in the book, The Best of Rod Serling's Twilight Zone Script. So I'm going to read you real quickly his quote. Here's what Jack Klugman said about our director. He said, quote, Don Medford was a wonderful director. He had all kinds of awards. He was good with cameras. He was worth $25,000 a year for me. He helped me with everything, lawyers, doctors, you name it. And we were good friends, unquote. Of course, Jack Klugman also says their friendship was strained after the, the uh, uh, trumpet episode of Twilight Zone due to a disagreement uh, that they had over how to play it as if drunk. Uh, and he said in that same book, he said, quote, I did it Don's way, and I did it my way. And Rod said, let's do it Jack's way. And because of that, Don and I were never close again, unquote. So, Tales of Tomorrow writer Frank DeFolita was also someone that I uh, interviewed in the late 80s. He scripted over a dozen episodes of Tales of Tomorrow, and he made it also a point to praise Don Medford. I'll read you his quote. He said, quote, Don directed all my stories, a marvelous director, just tops. It was so exciting. If you could have been in the control room to see him work, the man was like a conductor, jumping up and down, screaming, take one, take four. Your pulse was racing, your heart is pounding, because you know this is it. It's going out over the airwaves now. Boy, that does sound exciting, doesn't it? That was the days of live television. So let me tell you about our actress here, Mary Alice Moore, who plays Victor Frankenstein's fiancée, Elizabeth. She was on TV right at the birth of the medium. She appeared on shows like Lights Out in 1946, and then again in the same show in 1952. She was in one of the very first made-for-TV movies in 1948 called Stage Door. And she did early TV anthologies like Colgate Theater, she did several episodes of the Philco Television Playhouse in 1949. She did Craft Theater. She did Armstrong Circle Theater in 1950. She was on a few episodes of an anthology called The Web that we've mentioned in a couple of other of these commentaries. She did a few episodes in 1951 and 1952 of the Martin Kane Private Eye TV series. She did Edge of Night in 1956 and 57. And uh, I'll mention she was also married for a while to Broderick Crawford. She seemed to have closed out her career at the beginning of the 60s, although she can be seen in footage in the 1977 Larry Cohen movie, The Private Files of J. Edgar Hoover. 
Uh, the actor playing Elizabeth's father here is Richard Bramley. Um, he's also one of uh, Victor Frankenstein's former teachers. Clearly doesn't approve of these dirty things and shooting monsters in the balls and stuff going on here in the castle. Uh, he did another creepy anthology in 1950, appearing in a show that we mention frequently uh, called The Web. Uh, he, does, he did Suspense, another one we mentioned quite a bit in 1954. Uh, did an episode of that called An Affair with a Ghost. He also played Genghis Khan on the You Are There TV series, as well as uh, doing dozens of the TV anthologies of the era. Uh, even turned up on an episode of Car 54, Where Are You, of all things. Music for this show is, uh, is a little bit better than most. Most of the episodes of Tales of Our was just basically built from stock music that they got out of the network library or, or somewhat hastily composed organ scores. Uh, but for this episode, they actually had the benefit of having Emmy Award winning composer Irving Robin working on it. And uh, he pursued his musical education at the Juilliard School of Music for advanced studies. Uh, his earliest works like Sinfonia No. 1 earned him a name and after serving in the military during World War II, Robin returned to New York and began writing music for concert presentations and then for television and film. Uh, ended up having a pretty stellar career. He was nominated for five Emmy Awards, uh, one of which he won in 1980. He won an Emmy Award for original music uh, for a television drama. Uh, we're getting near the ending here of our, of our, of our episode. Uh, <laughs> note that uh, our good doctor here, such a, such a stellar individual, he's got uh, his girlfriend and his nephew there uh, serving as bait to lure the monster up. But of course, the nephew is real brave. Not going to let that mess with him. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about him real quick while we wait for the monster to inevitably show up here. Uh, the little boy uh, is uh, Michael Mann. Uh, he seemed to have no, he, did, he didn't do a whole lot. He did Hallmark Hall of Fame, Philco Television Theater. Uh, he did uh, Big Story. He did a couple of TV series like Joe and Mabel. did one called Mama. His final role appears to be a 1958 film called Now That April's Here. Uh, so he didn't have a whole long career, but uh, he, he's not bad in this right here, especially that scene where the monster holds him up in, in the mirror. If you notice, he looked really genuinely terrified. I don't think that they had rehearsed that with Lon and... Lon being a real big, strong guy and in full uh, physicality mode right then, uh, he generally looked kind of scared, didn't he? So I mentioned some of this equipment here. We see it in other episodes. We see it particularly in uh, Verdict from Space, the first episode. There it's actually supposed to be alien technology. Uh, but this seems to be props that they found in the, uh, in the network uh, warehouse somewhere. They, they dug out fairly frequently for the show. Now, getting close to the ending here, and this bit of directing on uh, Don Mifford's part is also spectacular, I feel like. Check out the way he makes uh, everyday objects in the room look menacing by moving the cameras around like a peeping Tom as the monster enters the room. There was a genuine air of dread there and a real fear you know, on the part that these two people in the cast, least equipped to deal with an angry and inevitable Lon Chaney Jr., the lady and the little kid, are being stalked by this monster. I kind of feel like Lon Chaney Jr. is doing his very best here to work with what he has. He has to stumble into the room here. He's got to just grab this piece of limp rope and pretend he's being electrocuted when the only special effects seem to be a couple of stagehands blowing cigarette smoke on him while the uh, studio lights flicker on and off a little bit. Uh, I feel like he does as good a job as one could possibly expect, and this overhead shot really clinches it nicely. Good job, Mr. Chaney Jr. Better than you get credit.